Okay, sorry, I apparently uh, thought I was recording and I was not. Um, so we're back here on the prioritizing hypotheses. We're thinking about uh, how we're assessing our patients in terms of uh, severity. Uh, we always want to make sure that we are assessing airway uh, and oxygenation if we ever have a patient who's struggling with that. Um, one thing we're also thinking about in terms of potential diagnoses is uh, ineffective airway clearance. If we have um, someone who has uh, fixed secretions in their airway potentially, um, and then we are always considering the fact that um, the highest priority is going to be actual problems rather than risk for problems are always going to be uh, more highly prioritized in terms of, you know, how we intervene with patients. All right, so uh, generating solutions. So um, independent nursing interventions, this is going to be for our upper airway, this is going to be our oral sectioning. Uh, for our lower airway, that's going to be our incentive spirometer and cough deep breathing. Remember, we're trying to prevent atelectasis with that. Um, for our dependent upper airway, this is going to be detubum. This is putting in that OPA, the NPA, uh, intubating or, or putting in a trach. With the lower airway, our dependent interventions would be to add oxygen uh, or do a thoracentesis. So yes, oxygen is actually a med. Um, remember, this is an abnormal intervention that we're applying to the patient, so it needs to be an order. We do want to keep in mind, though, that we need to treat our patient before we treat the healthcare system. Put the oxygen on the patient and then deal with the consequences later. No, we can't technically apply oxygen without order, but if we're uh, assessing a patient and we're finding something abnormal, these are unexpected outcomes. If we're dealing with unexpected outcomes, we need to call the people. Um, so we are thinking about this incentive parameter. We're thinking about pursed lip breathing. What we're seeing when we see pursed lip breathing is that the patient is trying to blow off CO2. Um, it is prolonging the expiratory phase and actually allowing for that CO2 to be blown off. However, uh, both of these, all of these interventions are secondary to doing just what the body is meant to do. We need to get the patient up and moving. Um, if they can get up and move and breathe and all this other stuff, it, sorry, if they can't get up and move and breathe, then all this other stuff applies. But we really want to get them up and moving so that they're breathing effectively first. That's really our first step. Um, and then we have our uh, oxygen interventions. Um, so this is going to be our nasal cannula. This is for, from least invasive to most invasive for this slide. So our nasal cannula is going to be when we are using um, a little tube in the nares uh, to deliver oxygen. So keep in mind that FiO2, that's the roughly the amount of atmospheric O2 that's actually provided. Air is going to be around 21% of oxygen. Um, if you look at this here, you'll notice that one liter of oxygen via nasal cannula is only 20% of the atmospheric O2. So this is not actually going to be truly therapeutic, especially for an adult. For ch children, it's a whole other matter, right? But for children who have those, or for adults who have those nice big lungs, uh, if our patient's hypoxic, we really need to put them on at least two liters. Um, and then this is going to go all the way up to six liters for a nasal cannula. Uh, once we are going above that, so six to 12 liters, it's going to be this simple mask, the second picture here. Um, what we are keeping in mind with this, there's no back on this one. Uh, if we are using less than six liters, what's going to happen is CO2 is actually going to build up because there's not enough air uh, in the mask to clean it out. So we're basically having them breathe in a paper bag. Um, if we have a non rebreather, that's this last picture here, this is going to be 100% FiO2. We can put them on this for 10 to 15 liters per minute. Um, this is going to be short term only because this patient is very sick. This is not okay. Um, and then we have our invasive methods. Uh, this is going to be our CPAP. This is a continuous positive air pressure. So it is during the inhalation phase, it's actually forcing air into the lungs. The main reason we would see this being used is for sleep apnea. Um, and then we have BiPAP, so this is a bi-level, uh, it's both the expiratory and the inspiratory phase, it's pushing air in and then sucking air out. The BiPAP is actually a ventilator, the only difference is that we haven't put a tube in their airway. Um, it is still external ventilation, these are very sick patients. Um, 
And then we have intubation and trach. These are just ways to keep the airway open to deliver all of these interventions. That's really all these are. Uh, keep in mind that if you ever have a patient who has, uh, who is intubated or who has a trach in place, and they become very rapidly uh, short of breath and symptomatic and hypoxic, the first thing you need to do is assess the patency of that airway. So assess whether or not the um, intubation, whether or not their tube became dislodged with the tracheostomy, make sure, make sure that their trach is actually patent, it's in place. Uh, so that's the number one thing we're going to do. And if it's not a patent, we're going to provide them a patent airway. And then, of course, we're going to call for help from all the people. Um, so for our chest tubes, that's what these guys are. Um, this is when we have that pleural effusion. Remember, we took put the needle in, but this was just to get some fluid out and to give it diagnostic, figure out what type of effusion they have. Now, if they have an effusion, we know it, we need to drain the fluid off. So we are either going, we're going to put in a chest tube. All the chest tube is, is a Foley catheter for the lungs. Um, this is going to be a gravity drain. It is sterile on the inside. It's just a little bit more complicated because of pressure. So we have fluid in the lungs, around the lungs. We're going to put a tube into those pleural spaces and, and drain it out. Um, so with chest tubes, the, uh, ch the chamber A is going to be that suction strength. It could be dry versus wet suctioning, depending on what the physician wants. Uh, we really don't see wet suction very much anymore. It's usually just dry. <clears throat> Um, with chamber B, this is our uh, water seal chamber. This is our most important. This should move with ventilation. So the ball should move up and down with ventilation as the pressure changes in the thorax. So when the patient breathes in, we have negative pressure, so that ball is going to go up. When we breathe out, we're going to have positive pressure, so the ball goes down. If the ball is not going up and down, the system has an air leak, and that's bad. Um, also, if we have an air leak in chamber C, we're going to see bubbling. So normal is no bubbling. Bubbling is going to indicate external air is being sucked into the system. Um, and then uh, we have the fluid collection chamber. What we want to be doing here is marking it every shift uh, for how much fluid we pulled out in order to keep track of the patient's eyes and nose. Um, and then we have uh, another intervention. This is called chest physiotherapy. We have two different ways of doing this. We can do this through a manual physiotherapy. So we're actually going to um, literally pound on the patient's back. So you're going to put the unaffected side down and then on the affected side of their lungs, you are going to pound on their back and you literally just pound on it and it helps to loosen up all the thick secretions. We also can use uh, vest physiotherapy. This is something we see a lot with cystic fibrosis patients, uh, especially those kiddos. They'll put on this vest that you can see here, and it's going to do the exact same thing as the manual uh, physiotherapy, just through the vest. So it's going to pound on their chest and actually help loosen up all those very thick secretions so that they can then uh, clear their airway and get it out. All right, so when we're evaluating outcomes, we're really just reassessing all of the things we assessed to begin with. So our normal outcomes would be to have a, a healthy respiratory rate, that 10 to 20, uh, adequate oxygenation, so that SpO2, that perfusion, uh, we know they're oxygenating effectively. And then our end tidal CO2, we're um, having effective exchange of the respiratory gases. That's what we want to see. Then maintaining their own airway. Um, are unexpected. This is when things go wrong and we need to call for help, right? This is the trach becoming dislodged. This is the uh, air tracheal deviation that we see. This is our patient declining and uh, needing to be placed on a non rebreather mask. Uh, so these are our sick patients. Um, just uh, think about what we would expect to see. We want to see, you know, the patient's oxygen saturation improving. Uh, their mental capacity would be improving. Their uh, ability to tolerate activity is going to improve with improved oxygenation. And I'm going to pause this real quick. And keep in mind that if we're going into a room and we're assessing, you know, an abnormal outcome where a patient is 
um, short of breath and they are laying down flat, one of the easy things you can do, which would also be an independent nursing intervention, is to change their position. Sit them up. It's easier to breathe when you're sitting up, right? This is why our patients tripod. Um, so change their position, provide them from uh, some oxygen, and then reassess. Is their respiratory rate better? Is their SpO2 better? And then we're going to continue on that cycle of uh, care delivery. All right, that is all I have for you um, for this lecture. I will get your fluid and electrolyte lecture recorded for you tomorrow and get that posted. And I will see all of you on Monday.